If we look at the right now, uh, the meat consumption in, in the world, as you know, United States is a number one uh, meat, meat consumer. But if you look at right now China, China is, you see here, uh, it's catching up very fast, but still between US and China, there's a significant differences. So we are talking about uh, the consumption is getting more and more protein based when we got more protein based, which means from the perspective of environment and the resources, as you know, meat is very much a resource consumption type of food. We need incredible amount of water and the land to eat meat. So this is a serious issue. I don't know, you follow FAO had a new report two, three days ago, everywhere we open our magazines or TVs or uh, internet, we talk that we don't anymore eat meat because meat is cancerogen. Uh, they are, uh, the, the report is seriously uh, pushing on this, how unhealthy eating meat or eating much meat, more meat, not the eating meat, but the eating more meat. But they don't really talk about the climate change impact or the resource impact because meat is a significant kind of uh, uh, climate change uh, induced uh, food production. Uh, so uh, maybe FAO should look a little bit more seriously also the impact of the climate change and impact of the resources if we keep eating a lot of meat. But of course, we cannot completely stop because the major protein and the protein is very important, especially for children. This doesn't mean that we should completely stop eating, but everything is moderation. So we have to really, we will be in the future because the meat prices are extremely expensive right now. We don't eat anymore as much as used to be. That's one reason. Now I'm talking about a little bit how agriculture impacts the climate change. So far, we talk about the how climate change is impacting agriculture, reducing our food uh, production and our fishing, uh, all kind of protein issues. But the pro production of the food also extremely important and extremely uh, problematic in relation to climate change. This uh, recently came, actually until 2007, no one was talking about this, but in 2006, I think FAO had a report and the IPCC uh, they gave their first report how agricultural activity is important uh, polluter, I wouldn't say polluter, but greenhouse gas emitter. So. What kind of emission we are talking about? In this picture, you see the carbon dioxide emission from the uh, deforestation. It's very, very important. And mm, nitrous oxide, which is using uh, a lot of chemical uh, fertilizer. And uh, also uh, methane, livestock. Uh, the animals uh, are producing a lot of methane gas, which is also uh, greenhouse gases. And the cultivation is basically, basically our agri-industrial activity is fossil fuel based. So we are transporting them, we are uh, freezing them, we use a lot of electricity and the uh, oil based energy to uh, produce food. So uh, it's very important, for instance, only crop and livestock accounts 15% of the greenhouse gas emission in globally. And this is the direct impact. Indirect impact, if you look at how, uh, how the industrial food system contributes to the climate crisis is extremely uh, interesting. Is, as you see, almost more than 50% of the greenhouse gas emission directly or indirectly comes from our agricultural and the food activity and how we eat our food. For instance, we don't eat our local food. We, we, all, and we don't eat food uh, seasonally. We eat foods every season everywhere in the world. This is a very, very dangerous kind of habit which came last 20, 30 years. 
It used to be not like that, especially when I was a child. We were not able to, we were not eating, let's say, banana in every season. <coughs> So there was a seasonal fruit, seasonal vegetables, and uh, also geographical uh, vegetables. Now we all, everywhere, we eat everything. So this creates a serious kind of uh, impact on climate change. Uh, moreover, there's another problem. Not every agricultural activity goes to our food security or goes to our food on table. As you know, many of the food, which, uh, which I talk already about, I keep repeating, many of the corn and soybean, as you know, completely goes to the animal feeding. The other one is significant part is the biofuel. Biofuel is a kind of way of dealing with the clean energy, alternative energy, rather than using oil or energy uh, or fossil fuel energy or carbon um, induced energy, we can, we sort of, uh, there was a way to dealing with reducing the greenhouse gas emission using corn or another, I think sugar cane and other kind of uh, vegetable based uh, energy. This turned out to be seriously important, especially developing countries, because uh, many of the European countries, in order to reduce their greenhouse gas emission, they went to Africa, they grabbed thousands of thousands of hectares uh, lands, and they started to produce uh, um, corn uh, for the ethanol. And turned out to be Africans were not able to even make their own uh, uh, livelihood. So this is a kind of serious issue that we should think about it when we make the climate change policies. In one hand, we should not really make the uh, vulnerable people's livelihood in danger. This understanding is not yet um, clear in the climate change diplomacy. We really, this is the, our job that we are trying to make it how the uh, climate change diplomacy should be much more uh, human rights friendly or when they make kind of policies, they should also consider the consequences or unintended consequences of the people that they are already vulnerable. This is a serious issue. The countries right now are considering to re reduce. Uh, for instance, European Union reduced a, a kind of ratio on this issue. And the United States also reducing uh, the subsidies on the corn. But it's extremely political issue. When you go to Midwest, there is no way to uh, stop the subsidies from big corn uh, farmers. So they, whoever tried to do it, these uh, senators or uh, congressmen lose their places. So it's a very serious kind of issue. They, you, they have to really uh, work together uh, not to be completely punished by, uh, by the waters. I don't know how it will happen. So what are the options, what we should do? Uh, there are some options that we can do it. We are not completely hopeless at saying this, all these things, oh, we are not going to handle anything. There is always a solution. It could be a little bit uh, maybe slower and maybe sometimes politically viable, but we really have to do it. First of all, we have to transform our food systems. As I said before, because the, the way in which right now we produce food doesn't really help uh, uh, hunger because now we produce food more than 10 billion people can easily eat fully and zero hunger, which means hunger and the food production are not connected. The food production and hunger is basically availability and accessibility problem. Accessibility would be geographically and also would be economically. If you get rid of the poverty, then you will get rid of the hunger because the food is there, available actually now in, let's say in Africa, 
lots of junk food around from the developed countries basically dumped to, the, uh, to their market, but people have no money to get it because they don't have job to, <coughs> to pay for this. So it is a serious economic issue actually rather than food production issue. So it's not an agricultural issue, it's a political, it's an economy, it's an it's a ideological issue to deal with it. That's, that's one issue, problem of hunger, how do we deal with it? We have to change our policy. And also, uh, overweight uh, is an important problem right now. 30% of the Americans right now is overweight. This is not only in the United States. If you go to India, this is 25%. Same thing in Brazil, it's very high. These are the very fast developing countries, but they are picked up the wrong way of uh, eating food. And then they are right now dealing with serious kind of obesity. Obesity, as you know, it's a serious disease, and it, with which this disease makes the diabetes. So health uh, uh, expenditure is very high. So many countries are right now dealing with this issue. One of the issue is how to produce our food. Because when we produce our food, we don't really care about the nutritious value. We do care about the amount and profitability. So that's another problem. If we have a um, economically, power, uh, economically good position, we pick our food to be more nutritious value. But people that they don't have enough economic uh, uh, power, they are not able to pick the right food. So the food system definitely should change. Of course, another one is the wasting of food. The 30% of the food globally waste after they produce. They are produced, they come to our table, and without eating, we go to the waste. This could be everywhere in the world, not only in developed countries, but in developed countries, the food basically wasted in our consumer level. But the developing countries' food are uh, wasted in the uh, lower level, in the production level, because they don't have enough infrastructure, they don't have enough market access, they don't have warehouses, they don't have highways, all these things that what we should do, we should uh, invest infrastructure in developing countries rather than giving them a thousands of thousands of weeds. This is a kind of issue that we really have to deal with it because all kind of thousands of thousands tons of weeds comes with the greenhouse gas emission. That is the connection between wrong climate change policy and the wrong food policy. It's not going to help to people, it's not going to help to climate change. And another important issue is uh, Instead of transforming the agriculture, this is sometimes is considered controversial proposal, but I don't think any controversial proposal is this, because uh, I don't know, have you ever heard the agroecology? Agroecology is, I'm sure if you uh, have the kind of agricultural background, you must heard about the agroecology. This is a way to deal with the producing food in a much more uh, environmentally friendly way. And much more, rather than monoculture, more heterogeneous kind of uh, system. For instance, animals should not be completely divided uh, with the crop uh, agriculture. They can be together and one helps to another and also basically supports the uh, local uh, production rather than the global uh, food and trade issues. This brings the technology and uh, policy issues together and also human rights issue. There are series of works in the United Nations and FAO working on that and many Latin American countries actually basically Cuba, Nicaragua, Argentina, Venezuela and uh, Brazil uh, are trying to make this kind of agroecology 
in their country. But the Brazil is a big country. While they are doing agroecology, in other hand, they are doing agribusiness. So because they have big, big, big country, they can do because they have enough land. So uh, it's a kind of interesting way to pick up agroecology because agroecology is not good for profiting. Because it's not good for profiting, the big corporations are very much against on that. And the big corporations come with their own idea, what they call climate smart agriculture. The climate smart agriculture is basically saying that agribusiness is good because in 2050 we have 9 billion people, we're going to produce food for you, just let us do. That is the climate smart agriculture. And it's a very interesting way of dealing with it because when you hear the smart, you think that it's a really good thing to do. But the smart means basically corporate interest making everything is global rather than local. The local farmers will be struggle. They will lose it anyway. They are losing anyway. The local farmers and the smallholder farmers are uh, shrinking all over the world, not only US, not only Europe, but everywhere. So this has to be some reversal. If we do the reversal, then we can really make uh, the policy uh, effective for the uh, reducing the hunger and reducing the impact of the climate change. Let me stop here and I think uh, I'm open to your questions. Thank you.